Hello, everybody. Welcome to the fifth installment of Aiken Gump's Arbitration Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Steve Baldini. I'm the head of litigation practice at, at uh, Aiken Gump. So the purpose of this series is to hear experts in the field of arbitration talk about important topical issues that are help to give you a practical guide for issues facing practitioners and clients in the field. Um, whether you're an advocate, a transactional lawyer, or a party to an arbitration agreement or proceeding, the series is designed to give you a unique and expert perspective on how to approach negotiations, agreements, and disputes. Um, we're honored today to be joined by Dr. Maxi Shearer, who will be discussing the topic of the proper law of arbitration agreements. Dr. Shearer joins a list of highly credentialed and distinguished lecturers for this series. She's a member of the Center for Commercial Law Studies and the School of International Arbitration at Queen Mary University in London. She teaches courses on international arbitration and energy, comparative commercial arbitration, international trade and investment dispute settlement, and international litigation and conflict of law in the LLM programs in London and Paris. She's a prolific author and has authored a number of texts on arbitration. Um, she gave a speech in 2018 at the Vienna Arbitration Days concerning the role of artificial intelligence, eliminating the human factor in arbitration disputes, which received the Global Arbitration Reviews Award for the best lecture in 2018. Um, I, I, I read it. I didn't watch it. I can highly recommend it to people. I didn't watch it because I was afraid of getting looped into some artificial intelligence uh, cyclone, Dr. Shearer. Um, Dr. Shear, she served as an arbitrator in over 50 arbitrations, uh, and recently she was appointed to the London Court of International Arbitration and received her first ICSID chairperson appointment. Uh, she's admitted to the bar in Paris and a solicitor in England and Wales, and has been regularly ranked by legal publications as a leading arbitration practitioner and one of the top 20 global elite thought leaders in the field. Um, we're joined also today by my partner, Hamish Lau, uh, one of the finest arbitration practitioners I've ever met. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Shearer. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much, uh, Steve, for kind words of introduction. I'm delighted to be here and uh, speaking to you for this fifth um, Akingham uh, arbitration lecture. I'm, I'm delighted to see so many familiar names on the list of participants. I only wish I could see these persons in uh, as well, um, but I, I'm sure we will have a, a lively debate um, at the end. So um, the topic of today's lecture is the proper law of the arbitration agreement, a comparative perspective. And it is a topic that sometimes is seen as a bit uh, too academic as uh, however, as we will see uh, during the lecture today, it has very important practical ramifications, um, as Steve mentioned, for uh, when you draft the arbitration agreement, as well as when you arbitrate or litigate uh, an arbitration matter. Um, when we chose the topic a couple of months ago, the decision of the United Kingdom Supreme Court in Enka versus Chubb had actually not been rendered yet, but uh, it was my hope um, that that would be the case in advance of the lecture. And I have not been disappointed, as you know, the UK Supreme Court has rendered uh, the Enka decision last month. And um, uh, at a very minimum, what one can say about that decision is it is an absolutely fascinating read, uh, both the majority's uh, decision as well as the dissenting judges. What I will do is use this decision as a stepping stone to discuss with you uh, the issues of the law governing the arbitration agreement um, in a bit of a broader sense and also with a comparative analysis. So what I will do is I'll first of all um, give you the background of the ENCA decision and remind you of the findings. I'm sure many of you will have read and reread uh, the decision, but it is 115 pages long, so it is worth uh, summarizing the main findings. Um, I will then in a second time give a couple of uh, remarks and analysis um, on that decision before turning in this third section to a comparative um, analysis and see how other solutions uh, in other countries uh, fare compared to the English solution. 
So let's start with um, the actual decision in Enka versus Chubb. The factual background is there was a fire in a power plant um, in Russia. Um, the party allegedly responsible for that fire was a subcontractor, Enka. And the contract between that subcontractor and the main contractor is the contract that contains an arbitration agreement um, with a seat in London. That same contract did not contain any choice of law provision, not for the contract, and uh, even less so for the arbitration agreement. Um, and so the dispute arose between Chubb, the insurer of that main contractor, and Enka as the subcontractor. Chubb actually filed actions in Russia before the courts, national courts in Moscow. Enka resisted those proceedings um, on the basis that there was a valid arbitration agreement and at the same time started proceedings before the English High Court requesting an anti-suit injunction um, against the proceedings in Russia, um, against the party starting those proceedings in Russia, um, and a declaration that there was a valid arbitration agreement. So it was in that context that the validity of the arbitration agreement and the law governing the arbitration agreement um, was raised before the English court. And it was pretty clear that if one would come to the application of English law, um, the claims uh, that Chubb found rather straightforwardly will fall under the arbitration agreement according to English law. Um, if Russian law was found to be applicable, it was likely uh, that Chubb's claim would fall outside the scope of the arbitration agreement. Um, the Court of Appeal um, uh, rendered a 42-page long decision that was actually quite uh, principled and forcefully written and came to the conclusion that the arbitration agreement was indeed governed by English law, English law being the seat of the arbitration, and therefore the uh, Court of Appeal found uh, that by choosing the seat, the parties actually implicitly also chose that the arbitration agreement would be governed by English law as the law of the seat. Um, in, in, in reaching that decision, the Court of Appeal noted that this area needed uh, quite some clarification. And I'm just going to read you uh, this paragraph from the decision because it has a quite strong and interesting wording. Uh, so the, the judge um, in this case said, in my view, the time has come to seek to impose some order and clarity on this area of law, in particular as to the relative significance to be attached in the main contract law on the one hand and the curial law uh, of the arbitration, that's the um, seat, law of the seat, on the other hand, in determining the uh, uh, applicable law of the arbitration. And here it comes. The current state of the authorities do not credit to English commercial law, which seeks to serve the business community by providing uh, certainty. So just uh, going back to the introduction of Steve, what the business community wants is certainty. And so the Court of Appeal said we need to get this question in order. Um, the case, however, then came to the UK Supreme Court, and as you know, um, the UK Supreme Court decided with a 3-2-2 majority, uh, uh, upholding the decision of the Court of Appeal, but following an entirely different analysis than the one presented by the Court of Appeal. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly talk a little bit about the majority's decision, the decision of the Supreme Court, but I'm also going to point out a couple of points that the dissenting lords um, have uh, pointed out. So the majority found that English law did indeed apply to the arbitration agreement, but as I said, using a very different path. What they said is that there was no uh, choice of law, no express choice of law, but also no explicit choice of law. And therefore, one would have to fall back to the law of the closest connection, which they found to be the law of the seat. So same result as the uh, Court of Appeal, but very different uh, reasoning. 
And maybe more importantly, in, in reaching that decision, the Supreme Court did line out the directions that practitioners, courts, arbitrators um, applying English law uh, should follow. Uh, and it, it is uh, probably these indications, these directions that have triggered the most um, uh, discussion amongst arbitration lawyers. So I'm going to try to summarize them in um, assessing three hypotheses. The first hypothesis is the easy one, and that's when the parties have specifically chosen a law to apply to the arbitration agreement. So the arbitration agreement says in the arbitration agreement that this clause is governed by law X. That's the simple one everyone agrees, and you apply that law. The second hypothesis is probably the one that is most common in international commercial contracts, and that is the parties have chosen arbitration, the parties have chosen the seat of the arbitration, the parties have chosen a governing law for the contract, but they have not chosen a law governing specifically uh, for the arbitration agreement. And it's in that most common um, hypothesis um, that the Supreme Court says that the fact that the parties chose a certain law to apply for the contract as a whole, that that in principle also applies to the arbitration agreement. And that presumption that the arbitration agreement is governed by the law of the contract is not displaced in and of itself by the fact that the parties have chosen a seat elsewhere. So for instance, if the contract says the uh, contract is governed by English law and you do have a seat in say state of New York, the principle will be that the arbitration is governed by English law and that the seat in New York does not displace that presumption. Now, there are two exceptions, and this is where it becomes complicated. There are two exceptions where the law of the seat would still be relevant. The first is, if the law chosen by the party actually invalidates or is unlikely to invalidate the arbitration agreement. That is what is known as the validation principle. The rationale is clear that the parties did not want to choose a law to the arbitration agreement that would actually invalidate the same. Um, the English courts had in the past sort of referred in, to this validation principle, but never so clearly as now in the ANCA decision. Here comes the second exception, and this is where you need to fasten your seatbelt because it's going to be a rocky ride. The law of the seat of the arbitration is also going to apply as an exception to the principle I outlined before, and I'm going to quote here, if the law of the seat of the arbitration indicates that where an arbitration is subject to that law, the arbitration will also be treated as governed by that law. I had to read this a couple times before I got it. I'll try to unpack it for you in giving you an example. Parties enter into a contract. They choose English law as the law governing the contract, and they choose arbitration with a seat in Sweden. So according to the principle of ENCA, English law applies to the contract and also applies to the arbitration agreement. But here comes the exception. If Sweden, as the law of the seat, actually contains a provision that says the arbitration agreement is governed by the seat, then you need to apply the law of the seat. And that's precisely what Swedish law does. Uh, and more specifically, Section 48 of the Swedish Arbitration Act says that the arbitration agreement is governed by the law of the seat unless the parties have chosen otherwise. So in this case, the presumption is actually displaced in favor um, of the seat. I'm going to come back to those two exceptions in a moment, but I did tell you that there were three hypotheses. So I'm just going to mention the third one uh, for the sake of completeness. This third one, of course, is that the parties have chosen arbitration, um, they have chosen a seat, but they have not made any choice of law whatsoever, not for the contract and not for the arbitration agreement. And it's in that case um, that the Supreme Court says that the law governing the arbitration agreement is the law of the seat as the one uh, being the law of the closest connection. Remember, that's precisely how in ENCA they got to English law. 
Now, that was for the majority, but I said there was a strong dissent. Actually, uh, Lord Sales and Lord Burroughs have uh, both voiced uh, uh, concerns. Um, they argued that uh, in the case at hand, the arbitration agreement should have been governed by Russian law um, uh, because, in their view, the majority had not given enough weight to the implicit choice of law by the parties. And according to those two judges, the parties had actually implicitly chosen Russian law and therefore also implicitly chosen, uh, sorry, implicitly chosen Russian law for the contract and therefore also implicitly chosen Russian law for the arbitration agreement. They also disagreed in principle with the um, you know, directions set out by the Supreme Court. And in particular, they said, in the absence of any choice, the law with the closest connection should be um, the law of the contract and not the law of the seat. So this is the summary, and it is actually a fairly short summary of, of the ANCA of the ANCA decision. Um, and as I said, I would now like to move on and give you a, a couple of quick uh, remarks and analysis from my side on that decision. I'll, I'll, there are four points I would like to make. The first, and this is a sort of quite preliminary remark, is that it is rather striking that three sets of rather senior well-known internationally arbitrated versed uh, English judges have come to three very different results. Uh, remember, Court of Appeal, in principle, the law of the seat, say for exceptional circumstances, the uh, minority of the Supreme Court, rather the law of the contract, say for exceptional circumstances, and uh, the majority of the Supreme Court sort of in the middle saying, well, it's in principle the law of the contract, but there might be exceptions where you get to the law of the seat. And, and these diverging approaches, um, all very principled and, and well-reasoned actually show the inherent uh, complexity of the matter. Uh, whether at the end of the day, the solution put forward by the majority of the Supreme Court will really clarify things, I think remains um, to be seen. My second remark is, and, and, and that is one where I take off my hat as an act academic and, and sort of uh, take my hat as a practitioner, um, is that whether or not you conceptually agree or disagree with the Supreme Court, one thing that is for sure, um, that on a very practical level, it is a solution that is quite complicated um, to implement. Again, uh, let me give you a, a concrete example. Um, let's assume the parties have entered into a contract where the governing law is the law of Qatar, and the parties have included an arbitration agreement with a seat in Switzerland. Now, if for whatever reason an English judge is seized of the question of the validity of that arbitration agreement, what the English judge needs to do is, well, it, the principle would be that it should be Qatari law as the law chosen by the parties uh, of the contract. But the English judge needs to A, ascertain the content of Qatari law, in order to assess whether or not Qatari law is likely to invalidate the arbitration agreement, and if it does, apply the law of the seat. Second, and at the same time, the English judge must also ascertain um, the content of Swiss arbitration law in order to assess whether the second exception might apply and whether Swiss law, like Swedish law, as I mentioned before, um, uh, has a provision that says that the seed is also the one governing the arbitration agreement. It does not in my, you know, in the real world, but this is just a, a hypothesis. The point I'm trying here to make is that it is a fairly complicated or very complicated um, undertaking for a judge to do in order to only determine the governing law, you need to ascertain the content of two potentially foreign laws to get there. And Ascertaining foreign laws is error prone. I, I don't mean to be disrespectful to any English judge here. They are indeed, uh, you know, very well versed in doing so and, and go at great length into um, getting uh, legal expert opinions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But 
I can just refer to the famous or infamous Dalla case where the Supreme Court said that it would apply principles of French law um, and then actually came to a result that the French courts in the same case uh, uh, came to quite exactly the opposite. So that, that just shows from a practical point of view that it is difficult to ascertain these foreign laws. And here uh, there is a risk that you need to do that twice um, in the sort of process and steps that ENCA has set out. Now, one way uh, around that, of course, is to include in your contract a specific clause that says that the arbitration agreement is governed by law X. And anecdotally, I, I have been uh, uh, you know, contacted more and more by my you know, commercial uh, negotiation colleagues at Wilmer uh, with questions to that effect. But we, do, we all know that dispute resolution get in, you know, dispute resolution clauses get inserted typically into the contract at the 11th hour and not necessarily with uh, much reflection. So I'm not going to uh, hold my breath that from now on all the arbitration clauses have these uh, specific uh, choice, of choice of law clauses in them. Another way of avoiding the complexities of ENCA and maybe one way that is less known is by choosing the LCIA, the London Court of International Arbitration, as the uh, governing institution. Because as you might know, um, the LCIA just revised its rules, arbitration rules, and the new 2020 rules contain a specific provision uh, regarding the law governing the arbitration agreement. I'm just gonna read it out for you. It's article 16.4. The law applicable to the arbitration agreement and the arbitration shall be the law applicable to the seat of the arbitration unless and to the extent that the parties have agreed in writing on the application of other laws or rules of law and such agreement is not prohibited by the law applicable at the seat. So what that means is if you have an LCA arbitration, um, it is quite likely that you never get to ENCA's solution, but you actually will see that the law of the seat applies. So this is a little bit in line with what the Court of Appeal judge um, in the ENCA decision had outlined. So we're, we're back to square one, uh, at least in, in, in uh, the LCA arbitrations. Um, now, my third remark, and this is somewhat stepping back from the ENCA decision and sort of thinking about uh, the question as a whole. I've been saying since the beginning of my talk, the law governing the arbitration agreement. But I think it is important to uh, remember and sort of have in our mind that there is not necessarily one law governing the arbitration agreement, but there can actually be multiple laws governing the arbitration agreement. And it can depend on two things. The first thing is the actual question that you ask. If you ask the question of the validity for the arbitration agreement, the answer might be law X. If you ask the question of the extension of the arbitration agreement to third parties, the answer might be different. And even if you only look at validity, um, it's not insane to suggest that the formal validity, whether or not you need to enter into an agreement in writing or not, um, is governed by one law. And the substantive validity, whether the parties actually agreed to arbitrate, is governed by a different law. Now, if you read Gary Bourne's treatise on international arbitration, soon in the third edition, you will see that he actually identifies no less than 13 different subcategories of questions um, that might possibly be governed by different laws um, regarding the same arbitration agreement. So uh, that is to say that there is not necessarily the law, proper law for the arbitration agreement. And equally, um, the question of the applicable law might also depend on the timing, on the timeline um, uh, uh, when you think about the arbitration. For instance, the question of the validity um, might be asked even before the arbitral tribunal is constituted. For instance, if you ask national courts whether or not to compel parties to arbitration. 
the question of the validity of the arbitration can be uh, asked again during the arbitration before the arbitrators uh, when they decide on their jurisdiction. And finally, um, the same qu question can resurface a post award in a set aside or annulment stage. Now, as the Supreme Court has said, ideally in an ideal world, uh, you should answer the question of the applicable law the same way, um, irrespective of whether you're at the outset, during or after the arbitration. But that's not necessarily always as easy. Let's think about the New York Convention. The New York Convention applies to recognition and enforcement of awards, so at the end. Um, and it clearly says in Article 5.1a, as we all know, that the law governing the validity of the arbitration agreement in the absence of a party's choice is the law where the award was made, i.e. mostly understood as the law of the seat. Now that works well at the end of the arbitration because you know what the seat is, but it might not work so well at the outset of the arbitration before the arbitration is even constituted because the parties might not have chosen the seat of the arbitration and the arbitral tribunal might not have had a chance yet to determine where it is. So that criteria that works in the New York Convention might not necessarily give you um, the solution that you need at the beginning, at the outset of the arbitration. All that is just to say that the question of the applicable law might vary depending on the time when you ask a question and the question that you ask. Now I'm coming to my fourth and final remark in this context, and really this just serves as a transition to my next section, which is the comparative one. Um, and that is that the Supreme Court has in several instances in the ANCA decision um, included uh, remarks uh, or sections that are entitled the international perspective um, and where it refers to international commentary and solutions in other jurisdictions. Uh, so, for instance, at paragraph 55 um, and following, um, the Supreme Court noted that the law applicable to the contract, the, the lex contractus approach, was supported by international commentators, that it was generally followed in ICC arbitration, and that it was adopted in a number of civil and common law jurisdictions. And here it specifically cited Singapore, India, Pakistan, Germany, Austria, and with a little question mark, Hong Kong, Australia, and Switzerland. And it's, it's that sort of paragraph that triggered my attention. And I did ask myself, what is the prevailing view internationally, if any? And, and this is where I have come up with this. I hope you can now see it um, on your screen. This is uh, a map um, that I have put together. Uh, before I give you uh, a little bit of the, explain you a little bit of the, the assumptions and the details and the methodology used here, I would like to uh, duly acknowledge uh, the help I've got in putting together that map from a number of colleagues. And I should say that it would have simply not been uh, possible to put together this map without their amazing help. So I would like to specifically thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Ole Jensen, Maria Parbon, uh, Benjamin Maltz, Paul Matuka, and Ongen Sipovic, um, uh, who have been absolutely uh, wonderful in supporting the research for this um, uh, map. Um, I should also say that for a number of jurisdictions, we used the Delos Guide to Arbitration Places, or GAP, as it is called, which is for practitioners a, a very handy guide on uh, 60 or so jurisdictions around the world. But even with this amazing uh, research help and, and, and resources, what is important is that this is not a simple box ticking exercise. And it's not one where you get a sort of clear white uh, or, or black or blue and yellow answer uh, uh, for, for this map. It is really one that requires quite a bit of um, analysis and, um, and interpretation. So you might disagree on some of the colors uh, just because of, you know, you might analyze it or interpret it uh, differently. And I'd be very happy to hear uh, the points where you might disagree. What is also important is that we have used for this map a specific factual hypothesis 
Um, and that is actually the one that I mentioned earlier as being uh, the most commonly um, in international commercial contracts. So the parties agreed on arbitration and agreed on the seat. They included a choice of law provision in the contract regarding the law applicable of the contract, but they did not bother to include a specific choice of law for the arbitration agreement. And in this factual hypothesis, we asked whether courts in various jurisdictions around the world are more likely to apply the law of the seat or more likely to apply um, the uh, contract, contractual uh, applicable law, the lex contractus, or any other um, solution. Now, we've done that for all the countries on that map that have uh, some of the color codes that you see on, on your left hand side. We have not done it for the countries that are in light gray. So if you have information on, I don't know, uh, Iceland, uh, Madagascar, uh, or, or, or Costa Rica, do please uh, let me know. I'd be very interested to hear. For all those that have a color different than the light gray, we did actually check uh, the relevant and information that we could get. Now, for those who are in dark gray, and this is in particular, but, but only to name a few, uh, Finland, uh, South Africa, Australia, and the United States, we came to the conclusion that there is, mm, we aren't in a position with sufficient clarity to say it's either one of those or a different solution. Now, this could mean either of two things. This could mean either that there wasn't any particular case law or statutory provision that helped us making that assessment, or more often uh, that there were diverging interpretations um, of a statutory provision or diverging uh, case law. So uh, that it wasn't entirely clear at the end of the day um, whether in the factual scenario outlined, you would end up with the law of the seat or the law contractors. I know that we have quite a few US attendees and I, I again, I would be interested to hear um, if you share, share that analysis. Now, let's look a little bit more in the other colors and, and blue and green in particular. Now, blue means that uh, for those countries, we established that it was more likely in the factual scenario and you know, except specific circumstances that the law of the seat uh, would apply. Now, looking at the map, you will see this includes in Latin America, uh, Brazil, uh, Mexico, Argentina, and, and Chile, just to name a few. Um, it also has uh, Nigeria and Egypt. Uh, it has China and Russia, which account for quite a bit of the big blue uh, uh, on the map, um, Indonesia, New Zealand. And in Europe, it is uh, includes, for instance, Germany, Poland, Sweden, and I emphasize Scotland. If you look carefully, you will see that Scotland has a little bit of a different blue on that map. And that is because we had to do this manually because of course, Scotland um, is part of the UK. So uh, it would only allow us to do this by country um, and not by jurisdiction. So we had to manually color blue uh, uh, Scotland. I do hope um, my Scottish friends do appreciate that extra effort uh, to make this important distinction. Now, green uh, are those countries uh, that we established that save exceptional circumstances, it was more likely um, that they would apply the law of the contract, the lex contractors. And here we have England, of course, after ENCA, but we also have Canada, we have Paraguay, we have India, Pakistan, uh, Iran, Mongolia. We have Singapore, you probably can't see it because it's too small on the map, but Singapore is there. Uh, and we also have in, in Europe, uh, for instance, Italy and, and Austria. These are just a couple of examples. There, there are, of course, more countries. I'm going to come back to the uh, yellow uh, and orange in, in just a moment. Um, but let me, let me pause here and uh, maybe draw some uh, preliminary conclusions um, on this map. First of all, I think one can see from that map that there is no solution worldwide that is prevailing more than any other. There isn't any color that has taken over the entire world, so to speak. Um, the other thing I think what this research shows is 
that the hinted suggestion in Enka's Supreme Court decision that the Lex um, contractors would be the internationally favored solution, I don't think is supported uh, by that comparative research. It's not supported in terms of the number. Uh, the green states are clearly outnumbered uh, by the blue and, and, and even more so by all the other colors. Um, and also it's, it's, it's not supported in terms of importance. There isn't any category um, uh, that is more important than the other, or let me phrase it differently. Uh, all of these categories have internationally important arbitral seats uh, in their categories. So um, I think that is, th those are important preliminary conclusions. The other point I wanted to make is I, I did say earlier that uh, the Supreme Court listed a couple of specific jurisdictions and it listed Germany and Switzerland as uh, more likely to apply the Lex contractors. Um, I, I don't think, I, I hate to dis disagree uh, with the Supreme Court, but I don't think that's right. I think uh, here it's, it's pretty clear that both Germany and Switzerland apply different solutions. Um, now, let me, let me take maybe Germany as an illustration uh, of what I mean and also how difficult this exercise is. Because the basic rule in Germany is not dissimilar to the one that was given in ENCA. It actually says the parties can choose the law applicable to the arbitration agreement. It can be an express choice. It can be an implied choice. And in the absence of a choice, you apply the law of the seat as the law of the closest connection. If you stop here, you think it's the same solution. And you miss out entirely that these two countries apply these uh, rules in a very different way. And the reason they apply these rules in a very different way gets to the place or the scope that the implied choice of law might be given. In the UK, and in particular under the ENCA uh, uh, provisions, there will be many cases, if not a very large majority of cases, where an implied choice of law will exist. Because the parties have chosen the law of the contract, it will also apply to implicitly to uh, the arbitration agreement. In Germany, however, uh, implicit choice of law is, is really, in this context, um, only found in a very, very limited number of circumstances. The courts um, have only done so when it really was absolutely obvious. Um, so one example is, for instance, if the parties have chosen uh, a German seat and German law, here the courts say, yes, that is equivalent to an implied choice uh, for the arbitration agreement. But frankly, no one cares because in that case, it's totally obvious that German law does apply to that arbitration agreement. You can name that implicit choice or you can name it something else. It doesn't really matter. And I've used Germany as an example here, but frankly, this is true for most continental European um, jurisdictions, namely that implied choice is something that has a much, it's much rarer and has, is much uh, smaller in terms of the category of cases. And I should say this is not only true for arbitration and the law governing the arbitration agreement, that is actually true more broadly when it comes to conflicts of law uh, uh, overall. It's, it's one of the uh, differences between um, England and continental European systems. And at the risk of maybe generalizing too much, I, I, I hate these generalizations, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. I think this is one of the fundamental differences between civil law and, and common law jurisdictions in that civil law jurisdictions try to come up with a fairly mechanical rule. Is there a choice? Yes, no. If not, application of the law of a seat. These are mechanical rules. They're fairly easy to apply. They're very predictable, but they're not as subtle as some of the rules um, in common law jurisdiction, and they might be unfair um, on the parties in a specific case. Um, the ENCA rule is more complicated, as I've pointed it out, is, is therefore less predictable, um, but it has the purpose and the aim of really ascertaining the will of the parties in every um, uh, case. So 
as I said, with the caveat that these are uh, very broad generalizations. Um, uh, this is sort of closes my point on, on the differences. Now, I said that I would come to uh, the red and the orange, and these are my two last categories and actually my last remarks. I am mindful of time. Now, the orange countries are the countries that apply the so-called validation principle that I've already mentioned before. This is the Netherlands, Peru, Portugal, Spain, um, and Switzerland. Um, so Switzerland, for instance, has even codified it in um, Article 178, Paragraph 2 of the Swiss Private International Law. Um, and it provides, I'm just going to read it out to you, an arbitration agreement is valid if it conforms either to the law chosen by the parties or the law governing the subject matter of the dispute, in particular the main contract, or to Swiss law. So you have three possibilities how you get to the validity of the arbitration agreement, law specifically chosen, uh, law of the contract, or Swiss law. Now, importantly, that means that even if the parties have chosen specifically a law governing the arbitration agreement, and that law invalidates the arbitration agreement, it can still be saved by using the law of the contract or Swiss law. And the rationale here is the parties could not have meant to specifically choose a law governing the arbitration agreement that invalidates the arbitration agreement. That must have been a mistake. I know some people disagree with that, but this is the Swiss solution. Now, the main problem with that Swiss uh, and others um, in that category solution is, is that it cannot help with all the questions regarding the arbitration agreement. It works for validity, but it does not necessarily work, for instance, for the question of the extension of the arbitration agreement vis-a-vis non-signatories or the interpretation um, of the arbitration agreement. Remember, in ENCA, the question really was one of interpretation and scope of the arbitration agreement. Do torts claim fall within the arbitration clause or not? And I think here the um, minority, well, I should stop calling them minority, but the, the decision, um, a dissenting decision issued by Lord Sales and by Lord uh, Borrow actually noted, and I think quite uh, to the point, uh, in my view, um, that the validation principle in that particular case would not have helped at all. I'm gonna quote what they said. They say the validation principle rests on the rational assumption that parties would prefer to have an, an agreement upheld rather than not. But it is, but if it is correct that it is no, not in dispute, um, sorry, but it, if, it, if it is correct that there is no dispute about the validity of the arbitration agreement in this case, the validation principle is not a reason here for favoring English law over Russian law as the proper law of the arbitration agreement. Um, so that, that is for the orange category. And now, uh, last but not least, the yellow categories of countries. Now, this stands for a solution that was developed uh, in, in France in particular, and has it been adopted uh, by uh, many countries, in particular in Africa. Uh, you'll see here Algeria, Mauritius, Benin, Togo, and indeed all uh, West African countries of the OHADA, um, the Organization for the Harmonization of Corporate Law in Africa. Now, what is that uh, French plus plus, um, if I may call it that way, uh, solution? Um, the idea here is that unless the parties have chosen a specific law, you actually don't choose any, sorry, you don't apply any national law at all. So you skip the entire question of choice of law and, and governing law. And what you do apply are international legal principles. What are those principles of international law? Well, they say that an arbitration agreement is valid um, if the parties intended it to be. And, and really, the only limit is public policy. Now, the advantage of that solution um, is that it has a certain simplicity. You skip everything that we've just said, which is determining the proper law of the contract. But there are two main problems with that solution, in my view. The one is also quite a bit of uncertainty, because 
it's nice to say international principle of intent of the parties, but what if the intent of the parties is not clear? What then are the principles of interpretation one should apply if not the one from any specific governing law? And my second uh, remark and second problem I see here, and this at the risk of being disbarred from my Paris bar when I have said this, is that I think this is a solution that is conceptually a little bit dishonest. It is a little bit dishonest to say that these are rules of international law. What they are uh, really rules put together by the French courts uh, to apply to international arbitration. And so quite provocatively, one could even say um, that in order to skip the choice of law question, the French just apply their own rules as proactive and arbitration friendly as they may be. There are just French rules, which they just call rules of international law. Now, I know um, I'm probably going to get my head chopped off um, for saying this, and I'm therefore probably going to better stop here uh, uh, for my uh, French friends and colleagues. Now, let me maybe conclude on this um, uh, conclude on this talk and, and, and frankly conclude on the comparative law exercise. And that is I realized how difficult it is, even on a fairly simple factual scenario, to determine whether the law of the contract or the law of the seed is going to govern an, an arbitration agreement. And now I'm going to sort of go back to the ENCA decision and what I said earlier. Um, if an English judge or an arbitrator or a counsel, in-house counsel or external counsel under the ENCA decision needs to determine the validity of an arbitration agreement, they might have to do exactly that. They might have to ascertain um, the content um, of potentially even two uh, foreign laws in that contact, uh, context. And it is, as I said, a fairly complicated exercise. So um, the Supreme Court decision in ENCA, this is my last word, might have clarified the principles, but they certainly haven't made our life any easier. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm uh, glad we have enough time for uh, some discussion. Thanks, Dr. Shear. I think we do have a few minutes for questions. If anybody wants to use the Q&A feature uh, on the Zoom call, uh, maybe I'll kick it to Hamish to handle uh, any questions. And, and, and I'll just start just so that, that we can get the ball rolling, uh, Dr. Shear. One of the things I was struck by was your, your comment about how oftentimes the choice of law provision is put in at the 11th hour and people don't give it a lot of thought. What's the most common jurisdiction that you find in your experience that people pick and should people have confidence that English law will, will give uh, an even playing field or that some other law will not? So I think rather than sort of what I anecdotally see um, in contracts, I think it's maybe more important to lo look at the statistics overall. I think, um, you, you know, each institution puts out its statistics. If I remember correctly, last time I looked at this, the ICC, I think, still had Paris as the seat most often chosen uh, by parties. But that might be but because, you know, the ICC is in Paris and Sometimes parties still think that that has an influence on the seat. Um, but, but of course, it's different for um, the IDRC, the, the, the instant, you know, institution of the international arm of the um, AAA, the American Arbitration um, Association. It's very different for the LCA, uh, CIAC, HKSC, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm not sure there is a statistic that sort of overall in the world looks at the seats. And, and frankly, a lot of those figures, because arbitration is confidential, might not necessarily even come to light. What I can maybe add, and, and very gladly so, is that there is a, um, I think, a, a more diversifying uh, trend that you see more and more uh, uh, jurisdictions, uh, for instance, on the African continent, in Asia, that are regularly um, you know, put forward maybe not chosen, but put forward uh, by parties uh, uh, for the seat of the arbitration. So there is a, uh, a, a diversifying um, uh, trend. And maybe uh, what helps is 
you know, initiatives like the Delos Gap so that you can actually assess what is the law in that particular jurisdiction so that you have an English uh, 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 very practical uh, sort of analysis or, or on, on those questions. But of course, if I were to advise a client, I would say go for the safe bets. You know, uh, there are a couple of uh, arbitral seats around the world that certainly uh, that you know uh, the, the courts will be arbitration friendly, you will get the support you need, and they won't at the end of the proceedings, um, you know, stupidly annul or set aside uh, or vacate an award. So um, as, as a counsel, you probably still want to be on the safe side. Thank you. Hamish, you want to take a yeah. look at whether we have any questions for, the, for Dr. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. There's quite a few questions. We won't get to all of them, but we'll try two or three. Um, some of these questions are quite long, so bear with me. Uh, dear Maxi, do you think the decision will increase the attractiveness of London as a seat, or is one better served to follow the rule if going to London than go to the LCA? 2020 rules? That's a, a tricky one. So as I said, if you have the LCAA, then you, most of the time, most likely you don't even have to go to the ENCA because there is now this specific rule in 1604. Um, <clears throat> does it serve arbitration um, and uh, England as a seat? I think what I would say is um, the uh, ENCA decision, as I, as I think you've got it, I, I think it's a complicated decision, but I think what it is trying to do is ascertain what the parties really wanted. And so this is where the importance of the law of the contract in the eyes of the Supreme Court, the UK, UK Supreme Court, is that in most instances, commercial parties, when they insert a choice of law provision in a contract, and that same contract has a clause for arbitration, in their minds, not being arbitration specialists, they will think that the law governing the contract also applies to the law governing, to the arbitration agreement. So I think it's, it's, uh, it, it is something that the um, uh, non-arbitration specialist intuitively would say is, is the better solution. Um, but it might mean, uh, like you know, uh, in 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 a case like Enka, if Enka had had a choice of say Russian law in the contract, um, that you will then end up uh, with an arbitration agreement that is invalidated, and then the parties uh, would have to litigate this out in uh, the courts of Moscow. Is that serving the interest uh, of uh, London uh, as a seat? I'm I'm not sure. Sure, thank you. And, and just a follow on question, more broadly, do you think ENCA marks or signposts the death of severability as a broader concept? I'm actually glad that someone asked that question because it is a bit awkward that I've done all this talk without even mentioning the separability uh, once. I really should have done so. So thanks for the reminder. It is, of course, the principle that we teach our students, uh, you know, in first class almost, uh, you know, that is what makes arbitration, uh, the separability that you have, the arbitration agreement that is separable from the main contract. So anything that sort of invalidates the main contract does not necessarily invalidate the arbitration agreement. And I think that principle is now you know, internationally very recognized. Um, the criticism then one could um, put to the Supreme Court is to say, well, you've just forgot about this separability because you say that the law governing the arbitration, uh, sorry, the law governing the contract also extends to the arbitration agreement. If it is a separate contract, how comes that that is the case? And, and what I would say, and this is going back to a little bit what I've just said a, a moment ago, I think what, what the Supreme Court um, is trying to do is to really think also not only about the arbitration specialists, but about the sort of common commercial lawyer drafting these contracts. And I'm, I'm gonna 
I've actually found the relevant uh, provision in, in the decision. It's paragraph 53 for those uh, who have the decision, uh, 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 Roman 4. Um, the, the Supreme Court says that there are a number of considerations of principle in favor of its law contractors approach. And one is that it avoids artificial artificiality. And I'm gonna quote what they mean here. They say, the principle that an arbitration agreement is separable from the contract containing it is an important part of arbitration law, but it is a legal doctrine and one which is likely to be much better known to arbitration lawyers than to commercial parties. For them, a contract is a contract, not a contract with an ancillary or collateral or interior arbitration agreement. They would therefore reasonably expect that a choice of law to apply to the whole contract, including the arbitration agreement, I add, that's not in, in the yeah. quotation. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Just a derivative or follow on question then. When arbitration people talk about substantive law versus procedural, there's often a temptation to say that the arbitration agreement and any pre arbitral steps, maybe mediation or conciliation in the multi tier dispute resolution clause, are part of the arbitration and therefore procedural and therefore to be assessed by the law of the seat. Given what we've just been hearing, do you feel that that dichotomy between procedural and substantive is now under question? And what, if so, what does that mean for um, so-called pre-arbitral steps? So I think the, the, this is a very good and very complicated question. So the, the everything sort of multi-tiered clauses and pre-arbitral steps has been identified as a potential area of concerns um, because it will be difficult to, as you've just said, uh, make the distinction between here's the validity of the arbitration agreement, this is a substantive question, and these are procedural questions, whether these steps uh, for negotiation, pre-arbitral mediation or whatever have been complied with. Um, I would make maybe a, a broader statement here, and that is contradicting to a certain extent the quote that I've just given from the uh, Supreme Court decision. Yes, the you know commercial lawyer might think that by choosing a, a certain law in the contract, uh, it will also apply to the arbitration clause therein. But frankly, anyone in the arbitration world that you ask when you say you choose the law of the seat, you do choose, choose the law that governs the procedure, the arbitration. And making the distinction that the procedure is governed by the law of the seat, but the validity of the arbitration agreement is governed by another, is something that intuitively feels uh, attention. And there is an entire section in, in, in ENCA where um, the Supreme Court deals with that argument. It calls it the overlap argument, that there is an overlap between these questions. And I have to admit, I don't come out convinced um, that there is no overlap whatsoever. There, there, there might be questions and pre-arbitral uh, uh, um, uh, pre-arbitral procedures is a, is a good example where it's very difficult to say here's the validity of the arbitration agreement uh, and here are procedural questions that are governed by the law um, of the arbitration i.e. the seat um, and I think therefore the solution of the court of appeal in the case or the solution of um, the LCA um, is not only simpler, but maybe more in line what arbitration practitioners yeah. expected. Sure, thank you. Steve, there's too many questions. We'll be here for another 30 minutes otherwise. So let me hand back to you, sir. Great, great, thanks. Thanks, Hamish. Um, well, we only we only booked Dr. Shearer for an hour, so we're gonna try to keep her on schedule. Um, she's in high demand. Um, we'd like to thank Dr. Shearer for this uh, very informative and topical and practical uh, discussion. Um, I wish we did have time to get more to more questions, but um, but but we're going to call it a day here. Um, we at Aiken Gump thank you, Doctor. We thank all the participants. Uh, Hamish, thank you for putting this together.
um, and we hope it was helpful and we look forward to doing it again next year. So thanks everybody and, um, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.